Coming up on Main Challenge, Economics and Racial Inequality. Hello and welcome to Main Challenge, a production of Lincoln County Indivisible and Lincoln County Television. I'm Mike Hers. I'm sitting in for Chuck Kruger, who is our regular host, who will be back next week. And we're delighted to have with us this morning Representative Rachel Talbot Ross, who represents the Bayside and Parkside districts of Portland, who just has been reelected to her third term in the legislature. She's the first African American woman elected to the main house. And we have with us also Garrett Martin, who is the executive director of the Maine Center for Economic Policy. He's an expert on Maine's economy, and his organization is a research and policy organization dedicated to improving the economic well being of moderate and low income Mainers. Rachel. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and the projects that you're working on currently? Yeah, sure. Good, good uh, morning. Uh, thank you, Mike, for having me. And hello to Garrett. Um, hey there. Uh, yeah, hey, how you doing? Um, thank you for having me here uh, with you today. My name is Rachel Talbot Ross. I am proudly a ninth generation African American Mainer. I grew up in Maine, uh, born in Portland, and I proudly represent part of Portland, as you noted. Um, I have spent most of my life um, growing up uh, within the civil rights movement here in Maine and working on issues of systemic racism. I serve in the uh, 128th legislature on the Judiciary Committee and Health and Human Services. Prior to that, I served on the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, I'm very, very proud of over 20 years of volunteerism and service uh, in the community, particularly focused on abolition of prisons and prison reform, voting rights, uh, and really bringing an anti-black uh, lens to public policy. So, and I think one other thing, if, if I can add, I, I believe that Representative Talbot Ross, your father was the first African-American elected to the Maine legislature, is that correct? He was. Thank you for mentioning him. Uh, Gerald Talbot, my father, uh, 45 years before I got elected, he was the first African American to be elected uh, to the Maine State Legislature. In nine and, generations. But that was, that was pretty recent by Maine history. I mean, that, that, that they have no representation from the black community until, what year was it, 50, 60s? Well, uh, my father was elected in 1972 he, and served three terms and then uh, 45 years later. Uh, so I was elected as the first African-American woman. It took 45 years. <laughs> and Garrett is the executive director of MISEP, the uh, Maine Center for Economic Policy. He knows more about the economy than practically anybody else in Maine. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about why you're interested in black racism and what uh, the what MISEP is doing in relation to this issue? Sure, Mike. You know, I, I have to say, I think there are plenty of people who know plenty about the economy in Maine because they're experiencing it firsthand, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I come to this work in part um, from a background, I'm a generation removed from poverty. Um, my dad was, uh, you know, one of these kids who grew up poor in the rural South, and uh, he managed to make it out. And I grew up uh, in Southwestern Virginia, um, actually worked in the Mississippi Delta for five years before moving to Maine on uh, promoting uh, access to home ownership and business development services for primarily uh, black owned businesses. And certainly through that work and, and other life experiences, uh, became acutely aware of some of the realities, not, while not my lived experience, certainly the, the reality that in this country, it's undeniable that our legacy of slavery and um, the history that that has uh, propagated in terms of some of the laws on their books and, and systemic biases that exist within our uh, policymaking uh, 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 landscape continue to, to this day. And so, 
as we do our work at the Maine Center for Economic Policy, one of the things that we're very much aware of is when we talk about make, building an economy that works for all people, that means all people. Um, and when you look at the data, it is very clear that there are disparities that persist um, to this day. And you know, one of my favorites, not the right term, but I think you know, a lot of people like to say, well, if, if, if you know, black folks, for instance, had as much education as white folks, then a lot of these disparities would go away. Well, one thing we know, for instance, from looking at the data is that um, black people who have college degrees are uh, uh, just as likely to be unemployed as white people who have high school degrees. Um, and so, you know, that's an example of where uh, there are other reasons and factors and forces at play for why we see some of the disparities that we do. Um, and, you know, Representative Tyler Ross and I had the, the opportunity to get to know each other early on in my time in Maine, because I think as we started to look at the data, um, we reached out to her and said, hey, look, you know, for instance, Maine had a couple of years ago, one of the highest black poverty rates in the country. Um, and what's that about? Uh, and how do we understand that? And more importantly, how do we take steps to ensure that that's not the status quo that we continue to um, have in the state? So we're, we're working hard with a number of different organizations and partners and folks like Representative Tower Ross to really understand not only the nature of these issues, but more importantly, how to move forward and, and address them uh, from, a, from a systemic perspective. So over the, over the last two months, we've been focusing on two serious epidemics in Maine. One is obviously the COVID-19 epidemic, but there has been an, an epidemic of resurgence of awareness, at least, about black racism. Um, how are these two related? And talk a little bit about how, how they're connected. So, I mean, the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, is only a symptom of what um, we know was true in the United States, which is uh, the pandemic of systemic racism. And so while in the last couple of months, uh, we've been focused on uh, COVID and um, looking at our public health system, what we know is that racism is a public health crisis. And for us to not see the, the context of COVID embedded in our history um, and in all of our policies and experiences that are uh, for people of color in this country would be uh, fairly naive. Uh, they, we are in a twin pandemic of COVID and systemic racism. The uh, public execution of George Floyd uh, seems to have awakened a white majority to the horrors uh, that black and brown people live through every single day in America. Um, the data, uh, the limited data that we have in Maine uh, is representative of the national data. For some reason, Mainers, there's not racism in this state because there's quote unquote, not enough of them. Um, but we, we have the data that we do have, and some of it of which Garrett uh, has mentioned, uh, certainly indicates that structural racism is alive and well here in this state. Uh, and in fact, um, we were founded within a racist uh, construction. Um, so they're not separate. You cannot separate systemic racism from any system uh, that we live under. It is embedded in every single uh, area of our social, political, and economic life. There's no debate. Um, and now the question is, since we have uh, white people are, as they say, uh, woke, now that white people are paying attention to this, as if it's new news, uh, the question is for all Mainers, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, and Mike, if I can add to that, you know, um, part of what Representative Talbot Ross knows, certainly we've, we've discussed before, is that uh, in Maine, for instance, when we talk about COVID, um, black Mainers are eight times more likely to be hospitalized than white Mainers. They represent 11% of people in the hospital versus uh, they, you know, accounting for 1.4% of households. Um, they're 27 times more likely to test positive. And certainly there are those folks who want to say, oh, well, this is because of, um, you know, living conditions or 
you know, health issues. Well, how did they get to those health issues or living conditions? Well, um, or how did they get into an at-risk situation to begin with? And one thing we know, for instance, is that when you look at who the frontline workers are, who the workers are, you know, cleaning up in the healthcare facilities and the hospitals who are on the front lines of nursing, um, who are, you know, uh, checkout clerks at your grocery stores, they are disproportionately uh, people of color uh, relative to the white population. So just from that stat alone, you have a population that's already uh, overrepresented in the sort of frontline community. And they are working in occupations that historically have not had the same kinds of protections that workers in other um, industries have enjoy, both in terms of wage levels and in terms of the ability to take time off when you're sick um, and those kinds of things. And those realities are very much steeped in our racist past. Um, you know, when the labor standards at the national level were enacted generations ago, uh, there was a specific carve out of uh, industries that were disproportionately uh, uh, the worker, the workforce were people of color. Um, and that was the way to get uh, Southern uh, lawmakers on board with, you know, some of those proposals. So, you know, we didn't get here by accident is the point. Um, and to try and pin some of the outcomes that we see currently on specific individual behavior is just a complete uh, misread and woeful ignorance of our history in this country. And I think, you know, as Representative Calvert Ross alluded to, uh, that certainly the incidents with George Floyd and Breonna Teller um, and, and many others have brought that into clear relief. Um, but this is more than about a discussion of sort of reforming our criminal justice system. It's really about unpacking how we got into this predicament to begin with. Um, which, which, you know, Mainers have always enjoyed this false, uh, you know, sense of, of um, I don't know, uh, equality, uh, because I was taught uh, in all of my curriculum that Maine entered the union as a free state. So we must be the good, the good folks, right? We must be the good folks. We entered the union as a free state, which ignores Maine's participation in uh, the slave trade. It ignores uh, what has happened, the American genocide of 1492 and its impact on our tribal populations. Uh, but it is a false sense of uh, really of comfort that um, you know we somehow here are better than other folks in other states, even though we're the whitest state in, in the country. Um, we we still operate off this kind of false sense of security around you know it's it, it doesn't apply to us that we do not have a problem of racism here in the state of Maine. The data that uh, Garrett is is mentioning um, you know is is alarming you know to have the worst outcomes for black african americans of covid in the entire country um but you know you just look to our criminal justice system and while we know that there are uh, similar uses for drugs between black african americans and white um black people still are very disproportionate in our arrest data um and in our sentencing so uh, we we don't have to look very far uh, to see that Maine has work to do, and part of that work means naming it, naming it, and then doing something about it. So we've got to name it, and then we've got to do something about it. The two of you are intimately involved in both you know the work that you both do in these issues every day. For many of us. It's only the unfortunate incidents of the last couple of months that have made people aware. In our little, I live in Damar, Scott, a little town of 2,000 people. The aftermath of the killings have led to 300 people out in the street protesting in the whitest county, the oldest county in the country. How do we maintain the kind of level of interest in these issues, how do we keep this momentum going? Because it's really important and it's gotten a lot of people who haven't been involved, involved. So, you know, Mike, I'll, I'll take a crack, Rachel. <laughs> you know, I, um, first of all, I should acknowledge, you know, I'm your neighbor in Newcastle. Um, I'm proud to count myself and members of my family among those 300 folks. 
Um, and, you know, the reality is, I, I think for all of us, this is a journey. Um, you know, there is there is no uh, end point that we're going to get to where we have, quote unquote, solved all these issues. And when I think about my own personal journey in this space, you know, I, I've definitely had moments when I've been called out for sort of instances of not being aware or being biased in a way that, that wasn't appropriate. Um, but I think what's more important, what I've found very instructive in recent years is really appreciating a lot of what, you know, Ibrahim Kendi has kind of coined as how to be an anti-racist. I think that that is most important because for so long in this country, and again, as somebody who grew up in the deep South, you know, you hear people say, oh, I'm not a racist. You know, I, I, some of my best friends are X, Y, Z, right? And therefore I'm not a racist. And well, you know, that may be well and good for how you feel about yourself, but the reality is it does nothing to understand, appreciate, and address the, the broader systems and systems changes that are needed to ensure that we truly have a society in which all people have a chance um, to, you know, uh, succeed. And, you know, the other thing is where we are is steeped in a deep, long legacy of racist history and past policies. And so, you know, we can talk about income inequality, but whew, start talking about wealth inequality and you've got a whole nother game going on. Okay. Um, and, you know, there you can't deny sort of what the realities are. So um, I, I guess my point here, Mike, is that it's, we all need to figure out, those of us who are white, how to be allies and, uh, uh, you know, good partners in this discussion. Um, but I think most importantly, we all need to really both check ourselves in these things and recognize that there's stuff we're going to get wrong. And hopefully we have the relationships with people who can help us understand where that is. But more importantly, that we can constantly say, okay, how, how can we ensure that this is not only not racist, but is actually going to improve outcomes for people of color and get us to a closer to the, to the, to the place we think we should be as a society. So Rachel, I don't know yeah. what you no, I, I definitely agree with you. And I would say to those people who are taking to the streets, you know, just keep keep doing that, you know, stay out there, be visible, uh, make your voice heard. We need you uh, to uh, keep rallying and keep protesting and keep marching. But we also need you to do something um, much more uh, impactful in terms of policy. And that is, you know, to follow the movement for Black Lives, you know, to look at what some of those demands are and to be able to um, allow, uh, and I would say um, actually uh, ensure that uh, people of color, black and brown people are part of your decision-making tables, that you know, we are um, not tangent, we're not your project to save, um, we're not the flavor of the moment, um, we've been here longer than you have. And so, it is time for yes keep up the keep up the marching absolutely keep keep that going keep that energy going but now what you need to do is you got to go to the main.gov and you got to sign up you know for notices uh when our state legislative committees are meeting and and see what they're meeting about look at what those policies are they're getting ready to debate and uh ensure that the folks who are representing you know that they need to make uh, racial equity part of you know, every, uh, their deliberations, that the bills that they write, they need to make sure that there is a specific strategy to address the racial disparities. Um, get engaged at that level. There are too many people um, in Maine who have no idea who their city councilor uh, is. They don't know who their state legislator is. And it's time for us, actually, I mean, the easiest thing is to change those demographics uh, to make sure that people of color are being elected to those positions, but also to make sure that any decision-making table that exists within your sphere of influence, that you are able to um, give that seat up uh, and or uh, ensure that that debate, that deliberation, whatever's happening in the public square, has the voice of, and the lived experience to inform uh, that, that, that idea, that issue. Um, and making sure that those, the folks who are most uh, impacted, uh, their voice is what's leading uh, moving forward. Until we do that, uh, I work in Augusta, Garrett, you're in Augusta. Until we do that, the same exact privileged white establishment 
um, is going to dictate all of our policies and all of the ways in which we live our lives. And I've got to say, no matter if it's a Democratic administration or Republican administration, it does not matter. Those disparities are generational. They are generational. We've not moved. It doesn't matter about the political party. We have not moved. So to those people in these small towns, stick to the streets, but you've got to get more involved in what's happening at the policy level in Augusta and I dare say uh, in Washington. And Mike, you know, I, I would add one other quick thing, which is I do, you know, again, both my kids were born in Jackson, Mississippi. We live in Newcastle. Um, we are, as you pointed out, a very white county. Um, and so I think one of our challenges is find, figuring out how we get perspective, um, as, as Representative Talbot Ross indicated. And so, you know, for folks who haven't, for instance, gone on the Black Lives Matter site and checked out their agenda, that's, that's uh, something. Um, the great thing about social media is you can find things that affirm your view or you can find things that challenge your view. And I would encourage folks to look for news sources, media sources that offer a perspective from, you know, people of color. Um, there's a great site, Color Lines. Um, I think it's a dot com. Um, but, you know, it, all the, the people who write for them are people of color. Um, they, I, I often find when I go there, you know, there are perspectives that, that I just don't think about as a white guy, right? Like, it's just not my general modus operandi. It's like, oh, I, I get it now. Um, and so I think that's, we all have to do the work ourselves. But as Representative Talbot Ross said, at the end of the day, unless we are pressing our leaders um, to be more intentional in how they're engaging this, we're not going to get there unless we're impressing, you know, established uh, party groups to think about how they're identifying, recruiting, nominating candidates um, and vetting them, you know, we're not going to get there. Um, so those are some local kind of actions that can make a difference at a broad level. And I would, oh, go ahead. I would say two other things. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, uh, rocket science at this point. Go to Movement for Black Lives. Black and brown people are telling you, here's the roadmap. This is what needs to happen. So we don't have to really debate it too much. Um, we need to fund uh, resources uh, at the local level. We need to build the infrastructure in these communities um, so that they are self-determinant. Uh, we need to fund and invest in, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we have the data. One of the things Garrett can tell you quite uh, unequivocally is that we do not collect uh, data. There is no mandate in the state to collect data uh, based on race. And so while we do have some good data, the wealth gap, obviously the wage gap, we've got criminal justice data, we've got some uh, education data. Um, it's not great data. We're not using the data to inform the policies. We're not using the data to shape our discourse. We're not using any of the data that we have right now. And so uh, go to Movement for Black Lives. It's not that difficult if folks want to know what to do. Uh, you'll hear a lot about defunding the police. I absolutely believe that we have to take and divest money out of the structures, the punitive structures that have disproportionately impacted uh, brown and black people and invest that money in the opportunity and the prosperity and the hope of these uh, communities. But uh, it's, not, it's not that difficult, Mike. It really isn't. We've, we've, we know what we need to do. What the challenge for us here in Maine is the political will uh, to do it, is to make sure we elect people who have the political will to do it and to take, don't take anything else for an answer. We must confront systemic racism now. One of the things that, that makes me feel encouraged is the involvement of youth. The Sunrise Movement, the number of kids who are on the streets, the number of kids who are aware of these issues. Garrett, your kids who were born in the South, I think probably are, have a great advantage because they saw, well, you got out of there before they were old enough to appreciate things, but I think they still must realize how important their view is. Well, I, you know, <laughs> to that point, Mike, you know, my, my son and I were down in Georgia for the election, uh, the last gubernatorial election. And, you know, for him, it was truly eye opening. I mean, the polling station that we were based at was one of the polling stations where they didn't have enough power cords for all the voting machines. And so they got a three hour line. And meanwhile, the local sheriff decided to show up and 
idle his car for 45 minutes outside while we were waiting. Well, you know, there's some real historic significance to those actions. And um, so they, you know, and, and I think that it's, it's easy being here to not understand those moments um, and those sort of many aggressions that people face. But, but I would agree with you. I think uh, my observation of young people is that they are a little more in tune with this. And yet at the same time, quite honestly, uh, as someone who works with young people in this area, I can also see how some pe young people, because they don't actually have relationships with people of color, um, find themselves easily slipping into uh, worldviews and belief systems that are extremely uh, detrimental to this notion of building an anti-racist society. So there's a balance there, but I think on net, you're right. I think there's a greater awareness. I think uh, you know there's there's greater presence of people of color at a sort of global level, but we still we still have a long way to go. I mean, the fact that we have two lawmakers of color in the Maine State Legislature, the Black Caucus is Representative Calvert Ross. We have 50% of the Black Caucus here, um, and Representative Craig Hickman. And I can tell you, you know, their voices have made a tremendous difference. Uh, but we need more voices um, in that mix. And it's not that we don't want for the people who are qualified and can do those jobs. It's that uh, we haven't sort of challenged ourselves to figure out how to uh, create the pathways and open the door and step aside so that those people can come to the fore. And some of them are. There are some great young leaders around the state who are people of color, and I can't wait to see them sort of take Thank the lead. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Rachel Talbot Ross and oh, Garrett Martin, you. for joining us. This has been a great show, and we've only scratched the surface. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. We'll come back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We recently lost John Lewis, a member of Congress, an iconic member of Congress, who is a moral leader of the sort we've never had before. We're very fortunate this morning to have with us Shelley Pingree, our own congressman, who will give us a tribute to John Lewis passing of Joan Lewis has been so sad for all of us. And I just learned so much from him. So much about the South, about civil rights, about the history of our country. And in Congress itself, I was there the day he said, um, you know, after the tragic shooting in Orlando, and we were so frustrated that we couldn't move forward on gun legislation, the Republicans wouldn't take up a bill when we were in the minority. And he just said, well, we got to sit down. And sitting down in the well of the house for you know, 27 hours, listening to his stories, listening to people talk about their own personal stories around gun violence um, from all places in the country and all colors and all you know, backgrounds, um, everybody had a story. And, and he was right there. And, and, and we'll just always you know, see him saying those words, you gotta get in trouble, you gotta make good trouble, you gotta stand up for what's right what you believe in, what you know is right. Um, it doesn't matter how many times he said it, how many times I heard him say it, it just meant so much every time. And maybe the most important thing about knowing John was that as a colleague, you could be in a crowded room, pre-COVID crowded room, um, on the house floor. And uh, you know, when you walk by him or, or had a question for him, he'd always say by, start by saying, you know, how are you doing? H how are you today? You know, what's going on with you? And, uh, you know, here you are talking to this senior member of the House, icon, legend of the civil rights movement, and he always had time for everybody else. He was always kind, never acted like he was too important to talk to anybody. You know, if it was my grandson visiting, asking him to sign the comic book or take a picture, I often had visitors who would say, you know, is there any chance we could meet John Lewis? And he would come out in the hallway and say hello to my friends or visitors from Maine and take a picture and, you know, act like there was nowhere else he needed to be. So we've been so blessed as a country um, to have him in our presence. It's been amazing that he was a member of Congress for so long and was behind so many important things that have been done in this country and just is a true inspiration to all of us. Um, we need him now more than ever, but I think we're all going to double down and and do what we know is right in, in the memory of John Lewis. <laughs>